and happy Easter. Welcome to this time of worship shared between six Unitarian Universalist congregations of the North Shore who have gathered in celebration of Easter Sunday. I invite all within the reach of this message to join me in welcoming all who are gathered here, perhaps giving a wave or offering a greeting in the chat bar when you hear the name of a community that you know or are part of. Welcome on behalf of First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church of Beverly. Welcome on behalf of the First Church in Salem, Unitarian Universalist. The First Religious Society, Unitarian Universalist of Newburyport. First Universalist Church of Essex. Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lynn. And the Unitarian Universalist Church of Marblehead. We are all here together. We would also like to welcome our newcomers, friends, and those of you who are still looking for your spiritual home. We are honored that you are joining us and hope that our time together today brings you connection and nourishment. Together, we have created a sacred space of hope and liberation that is open to all who wish to be in beloved community this morning. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you move, and all the ways you seek and create meaning, we are delighted to have you as part of our circle. Just a few housekeeping considerations for this morning as we gather for our live Zoom worship. As Justin mentioned, most of us will remain muted throughout the service so that our words and music will be as clear as possible. If you haven't already done so, please mute yourself using the red microphone button on the lower left hand corner of your screen, other, when, other than when you have a speaking role in our service. Connected in time, if not space, all are encouraged to participate throughout our service in any way that feels right to you. Please feel free to sing along with our hymns, to light your own chalice at home along with our worship leaders, and to simply be present. We are grateful for all who helped spread the word of our service today and for the work of our tech hosts, whose names are Justin Murphy Mancini and Cynthia Walsh from Newburyport, and Kenneth Griffith from Swampscott, who are supporting us this morning. If you encounter a technical issue and need some help resolving it, you can use the chat function, which is also located near the lower center of your screen, to send a message to any of our tech hosts who will have the word host as part of their screen names. Following our time of worship will be a fellowship hour and all are welcome to stay and connect with friends, both familiar and new. So once again, thank you for being part of this hour of worship and celebration. This wonderful community wide gathering is brightened and blessed by the presence of each of us who are here today. open with this poem entitled Easter Morning. You're on mute, she says to me, trying to sound chipper beneath the veiled tones of exasperation. I struggle to find the right button. Trying something, I spoke again. It wasn't much this thing I was going to say or had to say, but was unheard. 
it wasn't much and mustered some energy I uh, renewed an attempt to find the button unmute. I pierced my lips in concentration, scowling at the screen, my appearance blessedly forgotten for a moment while I navigated this. Try the lower right, she cheers me on, her tones more relaxed. The microphone button emerges now. I wave my mouse around. Gotcha, I think, amused that such small things suddenly brought immense pride to my life. The red line disappeared from the microphone image as my thumb worked its magic, clicking a pandemic of its own right, born of this viral pandemic. I looked up to the screen felt my smile broaden, my eyes soften. She is beautiful, I said again, as my daughter held up her precious newborn. Through the distance, the screen blurry with smudges, I could see her eyes well up. And I remembered the vulnerable, tenderness and amazing awe I felt when I held her, this now grown woman, in my arms for the first time, sharing her with my mother. Oh, honey, I started. I wanted our eyes to lock like they would in real life, the power surging between them the new one stirred, capturing both of our glances. And by some miracle, I could smell her sweet baby smell, memory I thought was long gone. She is so beautiful, I said again. My daughter looked up from her precious new daughter and said, she looks like you, Mom. It's a glorious Easter. Like the first hint of green by Jennifer McLaughlin. As the first hint of green begins to peek through the barren ground. As that little sprig grows into a healthy stem as that stem grows into a stalk that forms a bud. As that bud slowly opens with each day to form a yellow daffodil. Let us be like that first hint of green, renewed by the warm of the sun's rays, and ready to emerge with a new energy, ready to face the day. We light this chalice to bring a glimmer of that warmth into our space.
The Tiny Seed by Eric Carle. It is autumn. A strong wind is blowing. It blows flower seeds high in the air and carries them far across the land. One of the seeds is tiny, smaller than any of the others. Will it be able to keep up with the others? And where are they all going? One of the seeds flies higher than the others. Up, up it goes. It flies too high and the sun's hot rays burn it up. But the tiny seed sails on with the others. Another seed lands on a tall and icy mountain. The ice never melts and the seed cannot grow. The rest of the seeds fly on, but the tiny seed does not go as fast as the others. Now they fly over the ocean. One seed falls into the water and drowns. The others sail on with the wind, but the tiny seed does not go as high as the others. One seed drifts down onto the desert. It is hot and dry and the seed cannot grow. Now the tiny seed is flying very low, but the wind pushes it on with the others. Finally, the wind stops and the seeds fall gently down on the ground. A bird comes by and eats one seed. The tiny seed is not eaten. It is so small that the bird does not see it. Now it is winter. After their long trip, the seeds settle down. They look just as if they are going to sleep in the earth. Snow falls and covers them like a soft white blanket. A hungry mouse that also lives in the ground eats a seed for his lunch, but the tiny seed lies very still and the mouse does not see it. Now it is spring. After a few months, the snow has melted. It is really spring. Birds fly by, the sun shines, rain falls. The seeds grow so round and full, they start to burst open a little. Now they are not seeds anymore. They are plants. First, they send roots down into the earth. Then their little stems and leaves begin to grow up toward the sun and air. There is another plant that grows much faster than the new little plants. It is a big, fat weed and it takes all the sunlight and the rain away from one of the small new plants. And that little plant dies. The tiny seed hasn't begun to grow yet. It will be too late, hurry. But finally, it, it too starts to grow into a plant. The warm weather also brings the children out to play. They too have been waiting for the sun and springtime. One child doesn't see the plants as he runs along and oh, he breaks one. Now it cannot grow anymore. The tiny plant that grew from the tiny seed is growing fast, but its, neighbors grows, its neighbor grows even faster. Before the tiny plant has three leaves, the other plant has seven. And look, a bud, and now even a flower. But what is happening? First, there are footsteps. Then a shadow looms over them. Then a hand reaches down and breaks off the flower. A boy has picked the flower to give to a friend. It is summer. Now the tiny plant from the tiny seed is all alone. It grows on and on. It doesn't stop. The sun shines on it and the rain waters it. It has many leaves. It grows taller and taller. It is taller than the people. It is taller than the trees. It is taller than the houses. And now a flower grows on it. People come from far and near to look at this flower. It is the tallest flower they have ever seen. It is a giant flower. All summer long, the birds and bees and butterflies come visiting. They have never seen such a big and beautiful flower. Now it is autumn again. The days grow shorter, the nights grow cooler, and the wind carries yellow and red leaves past the flower. Some petals drop from the giant flower and they sail along with the bright leaves over the land and down to the ground. The wind blows harder. The flower has lost almost all of its petals. 
it sways and bends away from the wind. But the wind grows stronger and shakes the flower. Once more, the wind shakes the flower, and this time, the flower's seed pod opens. Out come many tiny seeds that quickly sail far away on the wind. Morning, folks. My name is Art McDonald from, from the Essex Church. One of our ministers, Mark Morrison Reed, reminds us the central task of the religious community is to unveil the bonds that bind each to all. There's a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and those of others. Once felt, it inspires us to act for justice. I can't help but think this morning of all those refugees at our border seeking shelter, seeking a wel welcoming hand. One way to act for justice is for us all to contribute whatever resources we have to sheltering people. On the North Shore, more than 20 congregations have formed a group called Family Promise that house people seeking shelter. It's a program that's begun many years ago and uses our sacred spaces to give homes to people as they seek more permanency. So we ask if you're able to be as generous as possible to support Family Promise, which will be our offering today and thanks to the Marblehead Church and Seth Carrier Lad, you can either send checks to UUCM mentioning the Easter offering to the church in Marblehead, or you can actually uh, do it by PayPal. And I think um, you will be given those instructions on the computer here uh, how to do that. So many, many thanks for all of your generosity and May we continue to home, to house those who are seeking shelter. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, We shall be changed, we shall 
You're on mute. Surely we have all heard that phrase at least once in the past year of pandemic life. You're on mute. Such a sadly perfect metaphor for life with social distancing. Visits with friends, visits with family, visits with anybody, all on mute. Concerts, sporting events, holiday celebrations, all on mute. Graduations, weddings, memorial services, mute, mute, mute. Life, life has continued, but muted. Like a vibrant painting drained of color, life not turned off, but turned way down. The feelings though, not muted. So many feelings, all the feels. Often they seem magnified, sadness, loss, isolation, loneliness, fear, powerlessness, overwhelm, anxiety, frustration, anger, depression. Two frequent companions for many of us on this journey. We've been on mute. We've been on mute and we have lived. Even amidst the death and the hardship and loneliness, life did not stop happening. Babies were born. Children were clothed and fed each day. We worked at home. We worked at the office. People gathered in nature and in backyards and in parks and in parking lots. We talked through masks. We talked on the phone, we talked on Zoom, oh, so much Zoom. We played games and read books and watched TV and crafted and home improved. Precious moments and times of joy, of connection, of happiness, of laughter, of love. We did not give up. We sought those sources and places of resilience, of toughing it outness, of making it through. We found them within, we found them in each other. We did not give up. We looked to our communities gathered in different forms for love and support. We came to church and found love and support in one another. We looked to nature and the gift of time spent outdoors. We did not give up. And we look to you, O oh spirit of life and love, you who have been one of those sources for so many of us. We are thankful this Easter morning that capital L life and capital L love cannot be muted. We are thankful that the infinite love that pervades the universe is indeed stronger than a pandemic even as we struggled sometimes to connect with that life and that love. Even when we felt disconnected, alone, even when we struggled, we did not give up and we will not give up. And so it is, we have gathered here this morning to mark a time of renewal and rebirth. The signs of spring, of renewal, of life awakening again appear. 
What wonderful coincidence that we are all getting vaccinated as spring arrives. As the earth has been through a barren period, a time of muted colors, muted life, muted weather, so have we. As the weather is warming and life springs forth from the earth again and color starts coming back to the natural world, so too is it coming back to our lives as we slowly and carefully begin the process of creating and recreating our human lives in a new normal. We are coming alive together, us and nature. We are coming alive together this morning, we six gathered North Shore congregations. We are coming alive together, our communities of human beings. We are coming alive, one hug with a loved one, one shared meal without masks, one connection renewed at a time. We have begun planning as religious communities how to once again worship in person together, how to reopen our doors for ourselves and to the world. We are coming alive together. Spirit of life and love, help us to heal as we begin to end this period of trauma. Hold us in love as we begin the work of healing our trauma. Help us find the strength and resilience we will need to navigate our return, not to what was, but what to will be. Our lives have been muted, but we will not remain muted. Our lives have been muted, but life and love will not be muted. We are coming alive together. The resurrection has begun. May it be so, and amen. Reverend Rebecca, you're on mute. Sally, you're on mute. Jeffrey, we can't hear you. What started as an occasional occurrence became commonplace within weeks, if not days. Isn't that the way it is? We step over the unpacked boxes on the kitchen floor from our recent move. That is now five months or more ago. 
telling ourselves we need to unpack those boxes one of these days. We subscribe to another important journal or a daily email about a critical topic, certain that this time we will actually read it. We recognize our own bad habits, vowing to stop and yet not. If you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always gotten, is the old saying. The past 13 months have forced the world to change, at least for a time. People had to slow down and find new ways to connect. We learned Zoom, remembered how to cook, and found delight in taking walks. We recognized that our health is not entirely dependent on paid gym memberships, that eating in restaurants is not the only way to enjoy good food, and that spending large amounts of time traveling is not the only journey to happiness. So too, did we come to appreciate how interdependent we truly are, how much we need one another and love one another. These have been vulnerable, humbling, deepening times. I witnessed all of that phenomenon in the you're on mute. It seemed to happen at least once every other Zoom meeting. Someone would be muted and either not realize it, not know how to change it, sometimes both. This muted person would be often filled with frustration, embarrassment, or anxiety as they fumbled for their microphones. Sometimes they would throw their hands in the air, just saying they don't know why it isn't working. Occasionally, they even had to hang up and log back in again. And yet what was so beautiful was how everyone else responded. The looks of compassion and care, tolerance, were moving. Whatever the situation, everyone else in this Zoom meeting was on their team. We cheered loudly, quietly, sometimes even silently, every time a person who had been on mute found their voice. We wanted every person's voice to be heard. As we emerge from this time, I invite all of us to make note of the good things we've learned and commit to actually doing them differently moving forward. We have the opportunity now to not do what we've always done so that we won't get what we've always gotten. What if we made this Easter a time of genuine change for the good? What if everyone's voice was heard? May we take what we learned that is good and holy and carry it forth into our days. May we remember that we are most definitely interconnected in need of one another and each other's voices. May we live from this day forward as though we are on the same team. It's called one humanity. And each and every person and every creature on that team, our team, is an essential part of our one holy, broken, and blessed universe. Amen.
It's not just tradition and memory that makes Easter the most popular church going day of the year, aside from Christmas Eve. It's because we so badly need this story, this great overturning, this story about a preaching, healing, challenging prophet of God's radical love who had holy wisdom and a holy message of compassion, egalitarianism, and the possibility of a kingdom of God who was executed, but not killed. They could not kill him. They could not stop what he started. The Easter narrative is bizarre, stunning, endearing, confusing, and for all the divine intervention, very human. I don't know what happened to the original community of disciples who saw and talked to and ate with Jesus after his death, but I trust and respect their direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder that they reported those thousands of years ago, a mystery that changed their lives and that changed history forever. He is risen, they were told. He's not in the tomb, he is risen. What's always shocked me the most about that report is the passive voice. He is risen. My Russian Orthodox Baba would always greet us on Easter morning, Orthodox Easter morning with the Paschal cry, Christos Voskres, Christ is risen. And we were taught as children to respond, Voistenos Voskres, he is risen indeed. But I'll be honest with you, as a lifetime, lifelong UU, I sometimes think that the reason so many of us shy away from the resurrection narrative isn't because of its mystical irrationality so much as that passive voice that distresses us. Because the implication there is this got done, this was accomplished, and you didn't make it happen. I think about that a lot. It's not just a linguistic throwaway. There is a universal or a universe of theological power in what that passive voice suggests. Christ is risen. Life is risen. Love is risen by the grace of God. This is so, and it isn't something that you or I did. What good news. What a saving message for the terminally busy, committee meeting having, planning, striving, organizing people we are. Everything that happens is not because of someone's effort. Don't we desperately need to hear that this year, most especially? Because it hasn't escaped my notice and probably not yours either, that even in a pandemic, even in a time of profound global fear, even in a year of isolation, separation, deprivation, of massive political conflict and politicized alienation, environmental devastation, even in a time when we are seeing heartbreaking backlash to progress, many of us have still maintained expectations of full productivity and effectiveness. To think that we are fueling all of that by just our intention and our strength alone is a form of death, my friends. And I remind you of the words of the poet Wendell Berry who wrote, not through your will alone is the house carried through the night. Bless our hearts. May we keep keeping on. May we be blessed in our endeavors. But may we remember as we do that we are not the great power at the center of the universe that pushes the shoot through the soil. We are not the origin and eternal giver of perfect love that casts out fear and breathes life into the tomb. We serve that love. We praise that power. We give thanks 
most humbly for every time we feel it moving through us, gathering us together and guiding us on. We try with our hearts, minds, and actions to connect with that power, to act out of that love, to be its witnesses and emissaries in our communities and in our larger world. Christos vos cres. Voistinos vos cres. Life, love, and hope are risen. Receive that. Soak it up like the green blade that riseth. You too are the resurrection and the life. In the Jewish calendar, the festival of Passover is just now coming to a close, either yesterday or today, depending on which practice one follows. It is not by coincidence that Passover and Easter so often intersect, of course. The second tradition is intim intimately connected to the first. The story of Passover is the story of the Exodus, the liberation of the Hebrew people from their bondage as slaves in Egypt. And central to this story is the prophet Moses, whose calling by the holy famously came through the medium of the burning bush, a flowering tree which crackled with fire and yet was not consumed. The story goes that the divine spoke to Moses and bid him go to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to carry the demand, let my people go. But Moses protested saying, please, holy one, I have never been a man of words either in times past or now that you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. We do not know for certain exactly what that meant. Some explain that Moses had a cleft palate. Others assert that a childhood injury had literally damaged his tongue. Still others describe the issue as a severe speech impediment. Whatever the case, it seems clear in the story 
that Moses was afraid that he would not be understood or listened to, and that that fear was grounded in a lifelong experience of being misunderstood or ignored. Yet the God of Exodus is insistent that Moses shall be their messenger, slow of speech or not. The liberation of his people shall depend upon the man whom nearly no one had ever listened to before. Aware of the miraculous healing stories and the general omnipotence ascribed to the God of the Abrahamic tradition. We might expect Moses to be healed in mind or body, to have his speech suddenly quickened and normalized. But this is not what happens. Instead, the voice from the burning bush directs Moses to go to his brother, Aaron. He can understand Moses and he can listen to him and repeat what he says so that others, eventually even great Pharaoh himself, will listen as well. In the story of Easter, the central event is, of course, the resurrection. Three days after the Roman authorities had murdered the teacher Jesus, it is said he was restored to life. He had a little more time on earth in which to speak with his family and his students, and then he ascended to heaven. But note for a moment, what does not take place here? His mother, Mary, does not get to spend the rest of her life with her child. His students do not get what they all must have been expecting for him to lead them in throwing off the Roman yoke and liberating their nation, because that is, by definition, what any second temple Jew would have expected for the Messiah to do. What was stolen in the crime of imperial murder, the terrible loss of the crucifixion, is not wholly reversed or undone. Rather, a new hope is carried out from an empty tomb and a new way to liberation lived into being by a small cadre of fervent believers. These last 14 months, our lives have all been muted to a greater or lesser degree. What was possible before has been diminished. It has been a struggle for many of us and a struggle that not all of us have survived. We have not yet reached, but are beginning to have a sense of approaching, a world come back alive again, of liberation from the liminality and constraint of pandemic. Such a global transformation would be rightly called a miracle. So let us remember this. Whether it conquers death or bids a king to hear a man whom no one would listen to, a miracle does not unmake what came before. It does not undo the injustice that preceded it. It does not overwrite the past. Most especially, it does not operate simply by making things normal again. But it does give new reason for hope. It opens the way to liberation and to new possibility. So may it be for us not to go back, but to go forward into something wondrous, unexpected and new. When we gathered for our first 
joint North Shore service in November, Reverend Kelly created for us from the sacred words and affirmations of all participating congregations, the North Shore Unitarian Universalist Unison Affirmation. Let us now bring it to life again by saying it out loud together. For the doctrine of reconciling love entrusted to us by our ancestors. For the sacramental search for truth to liberate both mind and spirit. For the blessing of the call to serve, to heal what is broken, and to help what can be helped. We give thanks this day as one body. Though we may be separated by distance, love unites us. Though we may be bound by our failings, truth frees us. Though we may be afraid of the world's great pain, service demands that we act. May the ways of the holy be revealed to us, and may we explore them together. My prayer for us today, and I ask you to join me, is to be present to this world in simplicity with daily tasks, to honor the silence, the stillness of God's grace, invisibly, inexorably, irresistibly delivering us from death to life for all time and in the breathing and walking that simplicity that we in our sorrow and weariness feel holy hope stir in our hearts again so that we too remember 
we are Easter people. And Alleluia is our song. Amen. And so may it be. <laughs>